Greetings, and welcome back to the Rose Rose Podcast. This episode, we are joined by Peter Vinyl, co-founder and president of Sustain Technologies, a Canadian-based cleantech innovator focused on municipal waste transformation. Sustain diverts the waste that would otherwise have ended up in the landfill, and through its commercial plant, the company is able to upcycle, recycle, and transform almost 90% of that material to create a wide spectrum of commercial products, from highly pure biomass pellets for energy production to synthetic diesel derived from plastics. Peter is the former CEO of Cellulose Partners, Fortress Specialty Cellulose, Ceteri International, and is on the board of directors of the Nova Scotia Innovation Hub. He also holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering from Monash University and an MBA from Tulane University. Among other things, we sat down and discussed how Sustain recycles approximately 200 tons a day of garbage from its facility, carbon pricing, and how the company generates a profit. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This podcast is sponsored by headracingcanada.com. Looking for high-performance ski gear this winter? In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is offering the lowest prices possible through its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. Good morning, Mr. Peter Vinyl. Thank you very much for doing this. No problem. It's my pleasure. For the listener, you are the CEO of Sustain Technologies. What is Sustain Technologies? Sustain is a company that is focused on recycling regular garbage that would go to a landfill. And, um, you know, it all started 10 years ago. My background is, is pulp and paper. I had um, a whole career in pulp and paper from, you know, engineer to chief executive officer. One of my passions was energy and finding lower cost energy sources for, for the industry. Um, I was involved in a number of transformations. That led me to Spain at one point. I was on a business trip and I heard about this guy cooking garbage. Being an old pulp guy, I like cooking and, um, you know, cooking wood. And so it seemed like an interesting idea. I went to see it, really was enamored um, with the potential of uh, of this concept. So so that became, uh, long story short, the, the foundation of Sustain. I decided that uh, this had to see the light of day. It needed a lot of refinement, but launched the company Sustain um, almost 10 years ago to the day. For the purposes of this conversation, I thought it'd be interesting to frame it from the perspective of a investor, so to speak. So maybe we'll go through a few questions for the listener. And, uh, to get yeah, I'd be happy to, to, to talk about that. Snapshot of the company. Is the technology proprietary? Yes, it is. So we have a patent on, on one core piece, which is actually that uh, the, the steam cooking part. But really, the value is in trade secrets. And what does that mean? Well, what I know is that, you know, we've been at it for 10 years and we've worked super hard, built a team with a very entrepreneurial spirit of um, just not accepting failure, uh, embracing failure, solving for every little problem that comes along and, you know, seeing a failure as an opportunity to learn as opposed to, you know, succeeding straight away. And so the protection we have, I think, personally, is more the grind that we've applied to the process because recycling garbage is hard. Like, it's not an easy thing to do. Garbage is everything. It's mixed. And so um, what we've been able to do is come up with a series of sort of relatively off-the-shelf technologies that but have never been applied in this way. And then we've been able to refine them in a way that we have an automated system for recycling waste. If you were to sum it up in 30-second elevator pitch, how would you describe the business? Um, so the business is is interesting because we take we get paid for the garbage that comes in because it would, has a negative cost. It's got to be landfilled. And we transform it at a moderate cost 
Um, and it's moderate because we use the energy from the plastic to help us run the plant. So we're, you know, energy self-sufficient. And then we sell the final product. So we've got revenue on both ends and we've been able to moderate the costs in the middle. How does the company make money? Exactly that, you know, by, by tapping into municipalities that, you know, have need a, a desperately need a solution for landfilling and are prepared to pay us, you know, a certain amount per ton of garbage equivalent to what it would cost them to landfill. So we've got a guaranteed stream of revenue over a very long period of time. We lock in a contract and we're able to produce high value final products. For example, drop in diesel, um, and, and biomass, you know, for, for energy as well as metals and other recyclables, which we can sell into the market. From the municipality's perspective, would the price of sustain be cheaper or the same as the landfill? Interesting question. Um, you know, I would say five years ago, we, we, during our marketing efforts, working with municipalities, it was, you know what, you, you need to give us a break here. It needs to be a discount, right? So 20, 30 percent less than tipping fee because, you know, we're, but that's changed. Now there's no hesitation to say we're happy to just take your solution because it's so much better for the environment and pay whatever it costs. You know, we, we obviously can't pay, you know, a big premium, but if you, if we can hold our costs to where we were on landfilling, we'll be happy with that. In order to create a symmetry of risk, so to speak, to bleed if the company doesn't go well with shareholders, was it a big capital investment on your end? Did you have to put your own money in? So, so the capital investment is really modest compared to our competition, right? Yeah, you know, my investment, my personal investment has been, you know, basically 10 years of my, t of my life, probably the most valuable 10 years of my life, um, with, you know, significant personal sacrifice. That's my contribution and uh, to develop this technology from an investor perspective. I think the risk is really moderate because we've proven each of these technologies that are in, in our plant in Chester. We're now operating on a, um, we're in the commercialization phase. The plastic part of our business is fully commercial. The biomass part requires uh, a couple of minor upgrades, and it'll be fully commercial. But it's proof of concept achieved and completely de-risked from, from our perspective. And for the listener, the plant is located in Nova Scotia. It's a giant plant that's already been built and working as we speak? Yeah. So so we broke ground a few years ago, and we've been operating for about a year and a half. Semi-continuously, as we kind of de-bottleneck and debug, we're running uh, three to four days a week now on plastic. So we take a, a, a reject plastic source from the recycling plant in Halifax, and we turn that into diesel and naphtha on a continuous basis. Um, on the biomass part of our business, we're running batches. We've identified a bottleneck that we're addressing. Uh, we're going through a financing right now to raise some uh, some capital to address that bottleneck, as well as give us a platform for growth. We have a number of opportunities across Canada that are uh, we're, we're waiting to exploit, and so we're raising funds to uh, to exploit those. Up to this point, how much garbage has gone through the plant? Are we talking millions of pounds? Well, of pounds is a really small <laughs> unit, right? <laughs> tons. Um, yeah. yeah. So in, in terms of tons, the nameplate for the plant is, uh, is 200 tons per day. So we've operated to about a hundred tons per day. We've got this bottleneck in the thermal hydrolysis that we're addressing. And part of the funds that we're raising right now will, will be going towards that. In terms of liters of, uh, of, of, uh, of fuel, I think we're, we're around, um, I think we're around a hundred thousand liters produced. When the products come out and they're turn around to sell the, I guess, diesel fuel or various plastic products, how do you ensure they're competitive in the marketplace at that point? There, there aren't cheaper alternatives that the customer can buy. Are they competitive from that perspective? Yeah. So, so the way we sort of built our economic model is we would make a dis, we would sell at a discount to commodity products like diesel, right? But. In reality, it's not working out that way because what we're finding is, for example, on the naphtha and diesel that we make are sufficiently light that they can be used as feedstocks for chemical recycling. So we've been able to tap into a real desire from global petrochemical groups to deliver recycled plastic from their facilities by taking recycled naphtha, that's you know basically naphtha made from plastic, and so we're able to extract a price that's superior to, um, to, to fossil fuel as, as a fuel use. 
And I think the same will apply to biomass in, in, in future. Uh, you know, currently, our base case is to have biomass be used as for combustion, so we replace fossil fuels with carbon-neutral biomass. Um, there's an environmental advantage in doing that. An economic advantage, you know, we will sell it at a discount to, for example, wood or other, you know, bioproducts, bio-based products. But we see circularity coming there as well. We've developed a product that is suitable for agricultural use, so basically an organic fertilizer. Staying with that same circular theme that we're seeing on the plastic side, where we won't be making so much fuel, we'll be making feedstock for plastic. The same thing, I think, will apply with biomass. Um, we're, we're in the process of gaining CFIA certification to be able to use our biomass as an agricultural uh, fertilizer. And we meet all of the criteria, so we're confident we'll gain that certification. And and so it's circular, right? Um, and it just seems perverse that... You know, in this world, farming and agriculture globally is driven by chemical fertilizers. You know, the yields that have been achieved in agriculture support, you know, 8 billion people on this planet. You know, someone told me once, and I just love this line, you know, why are there 8 billion people on the planet? Well, because we can feed 8 billion people, right? It's as simple as that. And we can feed 8 billion people because of chemical fertilizers. We've increased the, increased the yield, you know, you know, five, six times. The problem with that is it's not sustainable. And chemical fertilizers have a a high carbon intensity and they degrade the soils. And so over, you know, generations of crops, you need to be applying more and more. The crops become less tolerant of, of, you know, pests. And so you need to apply more herbicides and more chemicals. And so in the end, you're farming with sand and chemicals. That's essentially what we're doing. Organic levels in soils around the world have been declining precipitously. And at the same time, where is that organic from the soil going? Well, it's going into packaging and food waste that goes into the landfill that gets basically sequestered forever and produces methane, which is a horrible greenhouse gas. So something's wrong with that. And, you know, this is why we really are excited at being able to develop an agricultural product to put that organic matter back in the soil where it came from. To paint a simple picture, maybe in terms of widgets, is there a product or a widget, so to speak, that you guys produce that generates a higher margin or more of your revenue? Do you focus on one product more than the others? or Not, not so much. Like our system is really an integrated system uh, to, to deal with a population of, let's say, 200,000 people. Our capital cost, it, it's a complicated plant with, you know, a, a certain capital cost of, you know, around 40, let's pick a number, $40 million to build a plant. But there's not one widget in there that that's you know that that is necessary. There's there's a hundred widgets in there in that box. So wherever we can, we would prefer to sell to something that's you know, and and that's really where our name sustain, right? So we're aiming for a sustainable future. We we always get into sort of the climate uh, debate. How important is you know global warming? What's the impact of carbon emissions? And I think you know, personally, I've got a view on that. That you know we need to be doing more and more to to impact to 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 negate climate change. However, sustainability actually is the ultimate measure because is climate change going to impact us in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? Who knows? You know, I remember, you know, I remember in Halifax, some, somebody at the city once telling me, oh, we design our landfills. You know, those landfill liners are good for 100 years. And I remember thinking, wow, is 100 years a, a good solution? Right. It's not a long time in the scheme of things. If we're going to be thinking about something that's only good for a hundred years for our planet, I don't, I don't think that's the right answer. So we've got to be thinking longer term and um, we've got to be thinking sort of post petroleum. We've got to be thinking, you know, future energy. And so really the answer is sustainability. And again, that's, you know, that's where the name of our company came from. Part of running a sustainable business is generating profits. The critic might say, I like the idea and that green businesses are great, but how do you prove to me or how do you show profits and how do you measure that? Is it just simple cash flow at the end of the day? Is it is yeah. it on a widget basis? Just like any other base, just like any other um, sort of industrial 
uh, processing business. You know, we, we have inputs feedstock. We have costs associated with transforming those inputs into outputs and into materials. You know, it's a multi-stage process. And then we sell those final products into commodity markets. Um, and some of those markets are evolving to be circular, which is fantastic. But, but in terms of metrics for our business, it's just like any other business. Right? It's, you know, tons in, tons out. The biggest difference is the one I mentioned before, which is we get paid for our feedstocks. We get paid on the, on the front end and we get paid on the back end. And what's sort of magical about our process is we've been able to address our costs in the middle, right, to make sure that our costs are not excessive. And, you know, we do generate very good margins, compelling margins, actually. But in order to attract investments, you need to prove a return on capital, not just return of capital. When you're pitching to investors, how do you – make that proposition? Is it uh, give your money back in a few years, kind of the private equity model, or is it is the goal to go public? How do you, what's your value proposition really, to investors? Right now, we're, we're still relatively early stage. So, so it's sort of more a private equity model, right? So, you know, five to seven year return, um, here's a return we'll achieve over five to seven years. Our exit, let's say at five to seven years is going to be, um, you know, it'll be either, you know, an infrastructure fund, you know, or a very large waste operator that finally realizes, hey, the, w- the world is changing. I can't just keep hauling and burying garbage and making a lot of money doing that, that the world is caught, that, you know, technology is caught up with me. And uh, there are some signs that the large waste operators are, uh, are seeing that, but, you know, the existing model is still very profitable. That's the challenge is to make money and have a green solution. How hard has that been to get to where you're at now? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, all of this is hard. Raising funding for, um, you know, something that's going to take a few years to, to, to return on capital, return on the investment. Uh, I, I've been at pitch sessions where I keep getting this answer, you know, so tell me about your, your app. You know, so, so there's, there's, there's this focus on sort of short term, you know, h- how do I have a viral app that is, no, we're infrastructure. And, and what I would say is it's hard, but we've come up with a solution, uh, in order to, and the best protection we have for, you know, what's unique about our process is, is we've been able to continuously solve problems. And, you know, it's a, it's a challenging thing, but we've been able to do it. And, and for me, that, you know, I think should resonate with investors that you're not investing just in one machine or one widget that's special you're actually investing in a group of people that have developed this machine this but a culture to go along with it and the culture is is also very much don't stop like keep developing and you know we want to be the first to the market with this kind of solution and uh and i don't pretend that we'll be the only one the market is massive like the the addressable market here is huge and so if others are successful that's great Right. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're pretty close to the front, if not at the front. Maybe not the best analogy, but another infrastructure style business would be traditional energy, oil and gas and yeah. their difficulty getting investment when in a physical market, so to speak, instead of software. One way they've addressed that is return of capital through dividends and share buybacks and whatnot. Is that a route that possibly the business could go down or is it all just growth at this point? No, it just we're really just, it's just rule. Growth. So we're looking at a staged deployment where we plan to deploy one additional standalone plastic plant in Canada and one additional what we call generation two, which is kind of all of the latest sort of learnings built in also in Canada. And we, we will want to kick those projects off, um, you know, before the end of this year. Not all investors are equal. Sometimes investors are impatient. They want their capital back tomorrow. Has it been difficult to find the right type of investor? Do you have a preference or how do you think of that? I think it's evolving. You know, we, up till now, it's really been kind of friends and family plus, right? You know, we've got a group of investors, uh, mostly Halifax based, uh, Atlantic Canada based investors. Co-founder Robert Richardson is, uh, you know, very successful entrepreneur in his own right in Atlantic Canada. He, uh, co-founder of Killam Properties. And, uh, so he was kind of an angel 
in um, investor in the beginning and uh, sort of really grew to love and embrace the technology. And he's done a he's done an awesome job in sort of attracting you know that local friends and family group to get us to where we are today. But now we're moving to another level, right? And so we've got to sh- shift. You know, I think there's enough, and certainly in the Calgary area, I think I recognize that it's it's a much larger pool of potential investors that possibly are looking for uh, a greener you know, solution for for their investments than traditional petrochemical. And so that's really the theme of this current raise is to to reach out to that group of folks and uh, and not just in Calgary, but, but, you know, across Canada and around the world. How much money are we talking? We're looking in the range of just over 30 million for this raise. And uh, and of that uh, amount, just about half of it will be going into uh, developing the existing infrastructure and about half will be targeted at growth. Why Nova Scotia? Ah, Great questions. 10 years ago, um, when I decided this had to see the light of day, you know, I was... I was uh, running a consulting group. I'd had a whole career in pulp and paper. Uh, I decided I wanted to do this and commercialize this this concept. I'm in Vancouver. You know, the premier at the time, Christy Clark, was 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 espousing uh, multiple incinerators for the Lower Mainland as a solution to the waste problem uh, in Vancouver. And so there just wasn't an interest for Metro Vancouver in, you know, a new technology like this, um, given that backdrop. It was in Toronto talking to folks at the city there. You know, the mayor, Rob Ford, was, was pushing exporting waste to, to Michigan. And, and so, you know, I think close to half of the waste in Toronto was going across the border into the U.S., still almost at that level today. And so bottom line, the big cities just had long-term plans and ideas. And so very hard to intercept with some, with an idea, right? Um, so I needed to find a community, um, that was, you know, smaller and would embrace, you know, change in technology. And I'd had connections in Atlantic Canada in government and, um, the former CFO when I was the CEO of a pulp company in, in New Brunswick. My, I was talking to a buddy of mine who was my former uh, CFO, and uh, he was in Nova Scotia working for the government, and said, uh, "Peter, you got to come out here to Nova Scotia. We'll, we'll uh, see if we can help you get going." So went out there, uh, received some seed funding from the province, and so that was that was the beginning of, of that. And then really it was about a community that was prepared to support it. The, the story was I was uh, I was looking to build a plant further down the south shore. There was some land that the province had said you could use this. Uh, it was an old pulp mill site, I'm an old pulp and paper guy. Um, there was some infrastructure there, but there wasn't enough waste, right, for to build a full-scale plant. And we had a decision to make. Do we sort of build a, you know, a, a $10 million pilot plant that will prove the concept but not really be commercial, or do we build a $30 million fully commercial plant? And at the end of the day, the discussion with our, our team and our investors, we said, let's go for it. Let's, let's raise the money and build a full commercial plant. So we needed a bit more waste, and uh, I was visiting the community of Chester that had the third largest landfill in Nova Scotia, trying to convince them to ship their waste to uh, to this other facility. And the uh, the mayor of the town basically pounded his fist on the table and said, Peter, you're not listening. You need to build the plant here at our landfill. We got a landfill, but it's not the future. We, Even though we have this landfill and it's revenue generating for us, this is not the future. We love what you're doing and come and build it here. And I just remember thinking, path of least resistance, <laughs> right? And so that's how we ended up in Chester, Nova Scotia. Another thing the critic might say is that I'm not sure CO2 is a problem and that perhaps we can just bury our garbage. I don't care. Yeah. What would your response be to that? Well, it's not sustainable. Again, you know, getting a permit for a landfill in Canada is almost impossible now. You know, the environmental regulations are such that it's pretty much impossible to, you'll never get a new permit for a landfill. Uh, for a new landfill. Getting an extension of existing landfill is still possible in some places. N- in Ontario, not. So the average is less than 10 years of life of landfills across Canada. And what I would say is in the last five years, I've seen you know staff at municipalities across the country become more and more desperate looking for a solution. And so you know it's easy to say, well, let's just keep landfill. Practically, you can't. There isn't the space. And you could say, well, you know, Canada's got all this space. Well, but we've got environmental regulations that are there for a reason. And it's not a sustainable thing to do anyway. 
And so it's time. So why kick this can down the road? And, you know, yeah, maybe we can change the regulations. Maybe there'll be a government change and suddenly it'll be open slightly. We can dig more big holes and bury our garbage. But it's not the future. You know, I think about my kids and my grandkids, and I'm old enough to have uh, some, you know, a bunch of each. And I just think I, I can't, you know, support not making a change when I know I have a solution in my hand that can address this issue. And so that's what drives us at Sustain. What's the biggest challenge of the business going forward? So great, great question. It's people. It's actually finding right people with the right set of capabilities and perspectives to help us propagate the solution, right? You know, the labor market's tough and the work we do is not easy, right? It's, it's, it's quite entrepreneurial and it will continue to be that way. My dream is, you know, one day that, I, you know, relatively soon within some years, our process is a black box and we just, you know, basically push a button, turn the handle and, and out pops another one. But it's not quite like that. Like every location is a little bit different. The waste is a little, little bit different. So there's some engineering to be done. And, and then there's improvements to be made, right? So we're always improving our process. We've been able to, from day one, improve the energy efficiency of the overall process. We're completely self-sufficient, of course, but we're able to find ways to tighten up all of the, the you know, all of the energy loops and material balances to make it even better. If we're going to become a leader, which which we will, we're going to have to keep with that culture. So, so, you know, to just say, this is good enough, let's put it in a box and and crank them out. I think others are going to pass us, right? And so just being being afraid of that is is what kind of drives us to to continue to improve it. And having people that have the culture to do to support that is is for me the biggest challenge is finding those people. Some people will also suggest that the carbon offset from so-called green policies is more than the process itself. How do you prove that to people con- legitimately concerned about the environment that you're not producing more carbon at the end of the day that you're conserving? Yeah, well, we've had three independent expert consultants in carbon intensity audit our process and calculate the carbon intensity of our process. And they all converged on a very narrow range of outputs, which is that we are, depending on some assumptions around landfills and energy intensity from the grid, somewhere between two and three tons of CO2 reduction for every ton of garbage that we process and take away from a landfill. And I mean, that really is moving the needle a lot. Um, compared to anything else that we have seen. And, um, and so that's, again, that's third party validation. That's, those are not our numbers. Uh, in fact, the consultants came up with better numbers than we did in terms of <laughs> biggest opportunity. The biggest opportunity is actually carbon, right? So in our financial modeling, um, that we, you know, we present to investors, we do not include any carbon benefit, any carbon price opportunity. We see that as low hanging fruit, right? But it's an evolving thing, right? You know, there could be a government change and that could influence carbon tax regimes. And so because of the complexity and how it's evolving, we've decided not to include any of that. Uh, we still deliver compelling returns without it. That's the biggest opportunity to, to, uh, to sort of lobby and, you know, convince folks that, that there should be a sustainable way to enable us to monetize our solution. We'll drive landfills out of business pretty quickly. <laughs> If we can have access to secure funding for carbon, that would become maybe, yeah, close to our number, number one, you know, revenue generator, you know, assuming even just the current level of, of, you know, carbon price. What worries you with the business? What keeps you up at night? Is it the machines getting stuck and breaking down and foreign objects in the machines? As simple as that? It's it's the same thing. It's people. It's it's the ability to attract and uh, motivate the next group of folks to propel, sustain to, to a leadership position. It's exciting, right? Particularly, you know, what, what now I would say is, you know, we want, we're not the most diverse organization and, uh, um, we need to change that. And, and so I really want to change that. And so in our sort of recruiting efforts, once we're financed here, and we've already started recruiting, by the way, um, we're really sort of driving to, you know, diversity, not just for the point of diversity, but because we value different views, different viewpoints, right? And I think that's important. I think that's a great summary of sustained technologies. 
I really appreciate your time uh, t- this morning. If anyone wants to find you guys, you're on, on social media, I think, and also the website. Yeah. So we've got a kind of weird spelling of sustain. It's S-U-S-T-A-N-E. So if you were to, to kind of Google that, you'll no doubt find us. Yeah. But, but it was a pleasure to, to talk with you today and hopefully, you know, generate some interest in what we're doing. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time. We can wrap it up there. No problem. My pleasure. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking.